Let me ask you this question. How many of you today would like to be rich? Okay. Some of you. How many of you would prefer to be poor? Oh, I didn't think I'd get much there. Anybody going to buy that? How many of you would be satisfied if you were in between being rich and poor? Okay, most of us would in some way or another. And I pondered that question this week as I thought of a young man who's been dubbed with a nickname called Jeopardy James. He's been the guy that's won 34 programs in a row, games in a row on Jeopardy. And uh, his name is James Holtzauer. And uh, in those 34 games, he raked in $2.4 million. That's a lot of money to get on a game show, isn't it? And of course, he'll have to do his regular stuff that we all have to do, pay the taxes and all the other hoops that they you know, make you jump through. But uh, anybody want to guess what kind of a profession he has? Anybody know? You know, don't you? Yeah, what is it? Yeah, he's a gambler. Professional gambler in Las Vegas. And so somehow he came on this show, got on this show, and just started ripping everybody down. I think there was one show where he was the only one that asked, answered any question completely. Just ran the table. And uh, that's pretty nuts. But somebody, a librarian from Chicago, beat him here a couple weeks ago. And uh, I think that's pretty much. So I wonder about him. You know, he's, he's handled great amounts of money, I'm sure, in his life. But how is he going to feel six months from now? Or a year from now. If you read stories about people who win lotteries, you read good stories, but you read a lot of bad stories too. A lot of horrible things happen to people who win lotteries. And uh, a lot of it's because of their bad choices or because of the difficulties that they have with family members and so forth. And so we have that thing. I think the one thing we can say about Holtzbauer, or Holtzauer, I mean, is that if you weren't humble before winning 34 games and $2.4 million, you probably will have a hard time becoming humble after, for sure. Surveys have shown that most people want more than what they have in life. But it's not as excessive and as extreme as you think according to these surveys. People who earn $50,000 a year would like to have $75,000 a year when they're asked. Somebody makes $100,000 a year, they're usually, when they're asked, say, well, I'd like to make a hundred and a quarter a year. That would be okay for me. Most people don't take that big jump that sometimes we think about for sure. What I notice in some materials that I read is that there are, no matter whether you're poor or rich, there's nobody signing up for making 10 times less than what they made last year. Nobody signs up for that. So we're talking today about Matthew 5, 3, and we're talking about nobody wants to be poor. Nobody wants to be poor. That's the title of today. And that's a declarative statement that is made, that is not true in all circumstances for sure. But generally speaking, most people don't want to be poorer. They'd like to be a little bit richer in their life. And uh, they might just be looking for a step, maybe a step up in middle class. Maybe they get to upper middle class but they're just looking for moderation here, not going crazy with it at all. And so here we are with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's gathered all these people together, his disciples, and then you notice in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, now when Jesus saw the crowds. Okay, that wasn't just his disciples. His disciples came to him as well, and he began to teach them, but the message was for everybody that was there. Okay? And there were people coming from everywhere. In chapter 4, verse 24, we read that news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought him to him all who were ill with various diseases. And uh, some of them had severe pain, and others demon possession. Those who were having seizures and the paralyzed, he healed all of them. Large crowds from the, Galip- the Galilee and the De- De- oh, I can't say it right. Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up and he, on a mountainside and he sat down and he started to teach them. And so we're taking off with chapter 5, verse 3, which basically is very simple. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now these are so short and so easy to memorize You should be able to memorize all of them by the time we get done this summer with them. But why don't you say it out loud with me? Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. One more time. Say it strong now. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. 
Very good, very good. And we've said along the way that blessed meant to be content, okay? To have contentment in your life. And I think that's what these, uh, these uh, statements he's making here really intend to bring home to us. How can we be content? Every beatitude, that's what they're called here, every beatitude has a portion of it is for a standalone statement, but it's also part of a bigger piece of Scripture too. And the best way to really understand this is, is to think if, if I had a ladder here that was a 10-foot ladder that you could step on, you'd step on the lowest rung first, and then you'd go up and you go up and you go up and go up. So poor in spirit is the bottom rung of the ladder, okay? Now, why is that? Because the poor in spirit sets the stage for everything else that Jesus is talking about in his message, the Sermon on the Mount. And it starts with us being poor in spirit. Every one of them live, just feed off each other. You go up, you go up, you keep going up until you get to the top. One man wrote it this way. He said, being poor in spirit is having the right attitude towards sin, and this right attitude leads to us to mourn about our state as fallen beings. And after we've seen our sin and grieved over it, we are, make with the right, we are meek with the right sense of humility. This compels us to seek and to hunger and to thirst for righteousness, which shows up when we are merciful, there's another key word, toward other sinners. And this helps us to be pure of heart, which gives birth to peacemaking, and the result of being a peacemaker is, is that we are persecuted, reviled, and falsely accused. And then we ask ourselves the question, why would anybody sign up for this? This doesn't sound all that exciting. Well, here's why. Because it goes against the flow. It's countercultural to both the world that Jesus lived in, but also the world that we live in too. And sometimes you may feel like as a Christian that you are swimming upstream, so to speak, but it won't last forever. It won't last forever at all. There will be a day when we will be in eternity with Jesus. This morning as I got up and walked uh, to the, uh, got in my car and drove out my neighborhood, right there was just this great, awesome cloud structure with sun just coming down and just covering up the entire horizon off to the east. Now it's before all the rain and everything. And I just thought, you know, someday, someday Jesus is going to come back in the clouds. And it's going to make everything that we're doing for him worth it, for sure. And it starts with being poor in spirit. If you're a baseball player, you know if you've got a bat, there's a sweet spot on that bat. If you can hit the ball with a sweet spot, it can go a long ways, can't it? Well, what we're seeing in this idea of being contented, even though circumstances are not always the best, there is contentment brings us to the sweet spot of living the Christian life. It's something we search for and occasionally we get, but circumstances change. Many times our level of contentedness changes as well. And that's the problem with how we live tied to our circumstances. If things are good, we feel better. If things are bad, we feel worse. And all that kind of, But there is a sweet spot in the middle where you don't have to be dependent upon the circumstances of your life at all. You can be contented even if it's going bad or if it's going good. You can still be in that, that middle range where you can live off of the sweet spot in Christian life. It's called contentment. And when you have contentment, guess what you don't have? Well, you don't have much stress. You're able to take a breath once in a while. You're able to sit back and figure out the things that are going on in your life. Things that bothered you once don't bother you as much anymore when you're content. Contentment is a key ingredient to having good relationships with others, too. And when you have that kind of contentment in your relationships, then you have that contentment with God as well. So it all, it all ties together here. Have you ever thought about what truly makes you a content person? I mean you, not anybody else, just you. Maybe it's something that's really simple. Maybe something that's easy. If i got a basketball game on, I'm pretty content most of the time. And now they're only once every four days. So I go into depression after the game, <laughs> try to pull myself back up for the next game. That's what I do. Contentment comes in a lot of ways. For, that's something that kind of calms me and, and causes me not to stress so much. But maybe it's drinking a glass of tea out on the back porch. We've never had back porches that you could actually sit on in the summer because they all face the west. All our houses had west. This house we have now faces due east. 
And so even when it's hot out, it's kind of cooler on our patio. And so last night I was grilling some chicken and sitting out there and just thinking, man, this is the life right here. This is the good life. I could be really content doing this all the time. And Pam would love it if I'd cook more on the grill. And so that'd make her more content too. Interestingly enough, when we talk about the good life, what, do you, what comes to your mind when you think about a good life? What are the kinds of things that drive home for you? Those things, and they're going to be different for everybody, aren't they? If you drive to Nebraska, which my wife happens to be from Nebraska, and you drive in on major thoroughfares in Nebraska, you know what you run into? You run into a sign. Every one of them's got it. Nebraska, the good life. It's the good life. And I got to tell you, there was a time where I thought there's no better place on earth to live in than Nebraska because it's got the good life. I don't know what the good life was, but every time you run on the sign, you see it's a good life, that kind of thing. Well, what I want to do today is to tell you that Matthew 5.3 begins a journey here just in 12 verses of what the good life really looks like. And it is countercultural to what we think of. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's the first rung of the ladder, so to speak. And it's got to be there. And so you have to be poor in spirit. Blessed means to be content. That's what happens when we're poor in spirit. Different versions of the Bible shed some light on this. For instance, the Philip translation uh, says, Happy are the humble-minded, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The Living Bible says, Humble men are very fortunate, for the kingdom of heaven is given to them. The New Living Translation said, God blesses those who realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is given to him. And then the message says, you are blessed when you are at the end of your rope. With less of you comes more of God and his rule. And I think all of those kind of capture the meaning of what Jesus is trying to get here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Here's what blessedness and what poor in spirit does not mean, Okay. Number one, it does not mean that you have to have low self-esteem. And a lot of people think, well, if I'm poor in spirit, then I've got to hold my head down and you know, kind of be the party pooper and all that kind of stuff and you know, not, not be happy at all. But you see here that Jesus is putting the word blessed, which some translations use that word happy, are those who are poor in spirit. So what are they poor in spirit over? Well, one of, the, one of the other things I think is important is to remember that being poor in spirit does not mean that you're materially in poverty. Okay, it's not material poverty at all. And I think that's pretty important for us to, to figure out. I've got to get my notes right here. You would think I would know this. Jesus is on the mountainside reflecting both the poor and the wealthy. And Jesus was saying that we don't need to be materially poor, but we need to be poor in spirit. And that's what he would have instructed his disciples to do. Uh, the fact is, is, this is not a physical issue, it's a spiritual issue. That's what he's talking about here. The, sport, the poor in spirit, first of all, acknowledge that they need God. And that's the starting point with every relationship that we have. If you don't acknowledge that you need God, then you are wandering into the realm of what might be called arrogance. If you don't need God, then you need more of you. And as it grows and there's more of you and you push God out of the way, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. But we are to acknowledge that we absolutely have a need, a great need for God. Without God, we're utterly helpless in our attempt to get into the kingdom of God. There's nothing you can do to get there on your own. We're helpless spiritually without the humility that God calls us to. Being poor in spirit comes with the idea that we stand before God with empty hands. With empty hands. And that means we can't bring any righteousness of our own before God at all. It's about humility. And we saw that in those translations there. And this, to me, is a major theme that over the past several years has come out of my reading of the Bible, is just how important it was to God that we be humble. And the way to understand humility is to start with uh, chapter, th chapter 5, verse 3. We are poor in spirit, for sure. It's a lifelong process. Lifelong process. 
I don't think you wake up one day and say, I think I'll be poor in spirit today. And then all of a sudden you start wandering around and looking at everybody, looking at you. That's the way Jesus was. He, he didn't look at the crowd and say, well, they're this way or that way. He knew their heart and where they were. He had seen the materially poor. He had seen the lame. And he had seen the leper. And he saw the pain look on people's faces who lacked everything. And along the way, he also saw people who were self-reliant, self-righteous, and those who had more material possessions than anybody else, and yet they weren't happy at all. The Gospels reveal that becoming poor in spirit is a process. And if you want a study of this, I would encourage you to go to the Gospels and just check out Peter, who was always in this growth cycle of being poor in spirit. Now, what can you do to develop the attitude of being poor in spirit? Well, the first thing you need to do is do a regular humility check in your own life. Do a regular humility check on your own life. I think these Beatitudes are going to call each one of us to account. And uh, it's the best way for us to grow in the, in the heartbeat of the Beatitudes is for us to work on them every day. You see, you may have some sweet spot moments where everything's perfect, but I'll guarantee you, you also have some blind spot moments too, don't you? Where things don't work really well and you all of a sudden are off track. And uh, if you see a sense of pride coming in your, taking root in your life, or if you see your relationships seem to be a breeding ground for pride or hum, uh, pride and arrogance, then just know that one of the things that you and I have to work on constantly is to get on the path to spiritual maturity, which starts with being poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit means I can't bring anything to God except myself, and I let God do the work in my life. Now, I think, and this is just me, and it isn't thus say the Lord in the Bible exactly, but I think the longer we are Christians, the more susceptible we are to pride. The longer we are in the faith, the more susceptible we are to pride. We grind out day after day after day, and it all seems like it's going good, but then we pop up one day and we realize we just, there's some arrogance in us because we think we're better than everybody else. So one of the things I think is a real key to living the Christian life is to say to yourself, am I being a humble person? Do I have humility in my life? And if you don't want to ask that question of yourself, ask your spouse if you have one, okay? They'll tell you. They'll tell you, well, yeah, you're doing okay humility-wise. Or they may say, you know, I was going to talk to you about it. You're really an arrogant jerk right now. And uh, since you asked, I guess I would have told you that. Well, you know, you can have those kind of hard conversations with people. I know that Pam knows me better than anybody else on the face of the earth knows me. And so there have been times where I've said, help me figure out where I'm at on this continuum of humility and pride. Just trying to figure out where I'm at and how can I get more to be humble and less to be prideful. Well, it comes with us acknowledging that we don't have anything to bring to God. And then it comes with us doing this, this beatitude or this humility checklist in our, in our life. And when we do that, God will bless us. We, we will be contented. Now, it also says there in, that, uh, in, the, in these pieces that we should share the good news about contentment with other people. You see, I think there are all kinds of people in your circle and in mine who are trying to figure out how to become content and really struggle with it. So blessed are the poor in spirit. They can't really even get past the first word, blessed. What does that mean? You say, well, it means you're content. Content. Content in what? And uh, you, can be, you can begin to have a good conversation with somebody about what that means. This is the gospel, the good news. That, God, that is the good news that was meant to be shared with other people. So let's talk about contentment again for just a second. Talk about what that means to you. Talk about how you live your life in that sweet spot that we talked about earlier. Then let them see that being poor in spirit does not mean to be degrading at all. What it means is, is it opens up a whole new world of learning how to trust God because you realize you don't have anything to bring at all. You just bring yourself. You could say it this way. In order to be poor in spirit, you have to be willing to come before God with empty hands. And if you bring your musical talent before God, you say, I'm really musical, so I'm really special in your eyes, 
that's not an empty hand. If you're a preacher and you can preach really well, you can say, well, I, I've got this, and you want to give it to God so he can work with it. No, that's not what pouring the Spirit means. You don't have anything to give to God. You cannot improve on God's work over centuries with just your one-time, lifetime experience to say, well, God, you're going to be a lot better off once you really get to know me and the things that I can do. That isn't going to work at all. And I see God kind of as like a lot of fathers today who will just say, I know what you're telling me, but life's going to knock a couple inches off of you, and you're going to figure out that you're not all that you thought you were. And, uh, you know, when you're standing before God, the Father, I don't think we ought to be arrogant or boastful about what we can bring to the table because, honestly, we can't bring anything to the table at all. And so it's important for us to have that kind of attitude and then share it with other people, for sure. Now, he says at the end of this beatitude, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How does somebody get the kingdom of God in their life or the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's not through the lottery. You don't get a lottery ticket. It's not through the, uh, the stock market, okay? You don't know whether that's going to be up or down every day today. What you do is, is you receive the kingdom of God through a humble act of serving Jesus, of making sure Jesus is part of your life. When you receive the kingdom of God by remembering your poverty, your spiritual poverty, you're going to end up with the kingdom of God in your life. And when you come to him with empty hands, listen, just ditch all that other stuff that you think God's going to be impressed with. Come and hear the words of Jesus to the crowds. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And when you start on that ladder, that first rung, you're just up a little bit, but you're starting in the right place. Hey, read the Beatitudes sometime and look at how they connect to each other. And what you're going to find out is if you want to jump to the end and start building from the end up, you're not going to have a very good experience at all. It starts through and through with having a poverty of spirit in your life, of acknowledging that you don't have anything to bring to God at all. And if you do that, then you'll continue that ladder. And we'll look at that the rest of this summer, that ladder, which leads to, now listen to me for a second which leads to the real good life, okay? Now, I love the sign alongside the roads. It's always a good signal that we're almost at Grandma's house. But you know what? There's a lot more life than what the state of Nebraska can ask, ask for us, right? We find that in Christ. Be poor in spirit. You don't have to be downcast and sorry and ugly, and you don't have to be materially, uh, you know, in poverty, you know, in a material way. Just... Bring what you have in your heart, and God will take and run with the rest. Why don't you stand, if you would, please? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for Jesus and his teaching. And uh, some of these are just going to unpeel, uh, you know, they're going to peel back just like a, a good banana, and there's going to be good stuff inside. Sometimes there are going to be layers to here that we're going to study like an onion where you just keep peeling back and keep peeling back and keep peeling back. But these should cause us this summer, God, to really focus on who we are in you and realize that what Jesus was teaching his disciples and those on the mountainside was this whole idea of getting yourself positioned in the right way with you. So help us to build on this each week. We thank you for your love and grace in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.